Um, my name is Michael Perry. Um, I, my, my background is in C++ uh, programming on the server side. Um, in the last few years, uh, I'm doing a PhD in computational biology in Tel Aviv University. Um, I work uh, at my heritage, the science team, uh, doing biology. Uh, and I'm, I participate in the, national, the Israel national body. Uh, so uh, everything you're going to see here today, I'm doing as a hobby. And it's not part of my, my work. Um, so what this talk is about, I'm going to give um, an introduction to uh, working with C++. Um, trying, trying to write modern C++ code uh, on small microcontrollers. Um, this, um, it, it's pretty difficult to find a, a, a style of modern C++ that works in this setting. So um, this is what I am, am mainly going to focus on in this talk. Uh, and along the way, I'm going to describe uh, a project uh, I've been developing uh, as a test bed uh, for these techniques. Uh, and the aim of the project is to build an open source um, CW radar. And I'll explain more about this uh, in a bit. Sorry. So uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about machine learning. I, I, I needed to leave this part out. Uh, but I will give a sketch on how machine learning is done uh, in this setting. So um, part of the motivation for the recent interest in doing this kind of uh, um, project um, comes from the fact that microcontrollers uh, are becoming really strong and really modern, and they have a lot of capabilities, uh, and we'd like to use them to do um, much more complicated stuff than was traditionally done on microcontrollers. So if traditionally um, you had to do basic I.O. stuff or maybe operate a screen or turn the motor on and off, um, today there's a lot of applications in which we want to do DSP or um, machine learning algorithms uh, on the microcontroller. And this is called edge process. This is the, the buzzword in the industry, edge processing. Um, because the, the, program, the, the processing is done on the edge of the network and not on the server. Uh, and the reasons for not doing it on the server are basically places where you can't uh, use the network. Uh, and this can be for a technical reason um, if you need uh, higher latency than the network can provide, or you need to process um, a lot of sensor data that's not practical to send. Um, and sometimes the, the reason for not using the network is privacy reasons. So if you're developing uh, Siri and you want to promise the users you're not going to um, store their, their speech on the server, you have to do most of the processing uh, on, on the microcontroller. So um, th this um, caused a lot of recent interest in, in doing this kind of thing. And the burden here uh, is on the software that needs to do all this complex, complex processing uh, on very limited resources. Uh, and I, I believe C++ is the um, best positioned language 
to, to thrive in this setting. Uh, and the, the, reason, the reason why is that this is um, this falls uh, in, in right in the middle of where C++ uh, is trying to do best. Um, one of the mottos that we even saw um, yesterday on the slide is don't leave room for a lower level language. Um, so um, we have a focus on zero cost abstractions, uh, which fits very well in this setting. Um, we have much richer static data types, a type system. Um, the traditional tool in this setting, which is C, and the traditional style used has a lot of casts, a lot of use of row pointers, um, which basically means uh, in practice there is no type system because you just freely cast between um, different structs and different types. Um, so this is very error prone and doesn't um, facilitate writing very complicated uh, analysis. Uh, so in C++ we have a richer type system. We have um, a metaprogramming, which can be used for some optimizations. Uh, and most important of all, we have compatibility. Um, we, we are forced to use some C code uh, in any project, because many of the libraries we use are C libraries. Uh, and we also need to use assembler for some um, some specialized stuff. So C++ allows us to write the algorithm in C++ and mix um, translation units from other languages uh, and call C functions freely. So this is um, really crucial uh, in this setting. So these are the um, strengths of C++ in this setting. And there are also problems, and uh, you'll see um, some, of the difficulty, some of the difficulties I ran into uh, later in this talk. Um, so basically, um, working in this setting means you're kind of uh, an orphan. Uh, in the C++ world, um, you're a special case that's not really taken um, into consideration usually. Um, if, if you want a standard library that doesn't have, uh, doesn't use exceptions in the heap, uh, even telling you which functions you can call and which not uh, is a process that's taking, taking years. So um, many of the features that um, you will hear about in, in the rest of the talks are simply not appropriate uh, in this setting. Um, so uh, we're talking about no exceptions and no heap. Uh, and these are the big constraints. There are other um, constraints that can also occur in, in on the smaller uh, microcontrollers, like limited stack size. Um, but th these are the big um, constraints. So you have limited library support at all. Oh, s sorry, I meant to say, so in, in C++ world, you're kind of an orphan. And in the embedded world, you're also uh, looked as some, 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 someone a little bit strange. is trying to use a language that's not appropriate for the task. Uh, so you're kind of in the middle. Um, so um, you have to, to find your own libraries that you can use. You have to um, develop your own style. Uh, and there's lo not a lot of um, guidelines uh, for with what style um, is appropriate. And although in recent years there's been a lot of uh, talks about um, different people trying to develop this style, and you can hear um, 
really good uh, talks from CPPCon and other places from recent years that are trying to, to tackle this. So um, now there's a lot of work done uh, on this. So um, a few words about the project. Um, the project is supposed to be a, a platform um, from which you can use um, CW or continuous wave radar. Um, this is a, a radar sensor that's uh, available. I got it from AliExpress. Um, they are very cheap. Um, they have a lot of capabilities, and they're used, I think, mostly for the automotive industry. Um, but in, in the industry, they're being used for a lot of different uh, tasks. But there's no open source um, support or um, knowledge about how to use them. So this was another goal uh, I tried to tackle here. Um, the, the fun thing about sensors is that they are very flexible, and I'll show uh, how later in this talk. Um, but the principle is that the capabilities are defined by the software you, you run um, to, to use them. The, the sensor is very flexible and can give you a lot of capabilities, and only the software de um, determines uh, what you can actually do with it. So a few words about the platform I'm, I'm developing on, because uh, the embedded world is very um, differentiated. Uh, so I want to focus on um, the, the setting I'm working in. So this is a modern 32-bit uh, um, ARM core. Um, it has a lot of capabilities. It, uh, it, it, it has a lot of peripherals, and I'll, I'll show, show them some of them later. Um, it has a lot of processing power. It's running on 168 megahertz, which is quite fast for a microcontroller. Um, it has a moderately generous amount of RAM, uh, 192K. Uh, it has DSP instructions. It has an FPU. Um, it has a memory protection unit, so it, it can actually run an operating system. But I'm not using an operating system in this uh, project. Uh, so no OS, no threads, um, single process running on, on the bare, bare metal. Um, but there is concurrency, uh, as we'll see. Um, this platform has a lot of... Um, uh, it's, it's quite popular in the open source community. Uh, spe specifically, the STM uh, chips uh, are quite popular. Um, we can use uh, normal um, C++ compilers. Uh, Clang and GCC bo both work very well, recent versions. So we can use C++20. Um, this is not um, a given in this setting, because chips from other vendors um, are locked into a special um, compiler, non-open source compiler, um, uh, provided by the vendor. So in that setting, of course, you're not going to get C++. Um, so this platform is very um, nice. It's very um, convenient for this kind of work. Um, again, there's no heap, no exceptions. Uh, but we do have uh, a few standard libraries that give us the, the basic um, operations um, that, that we would expect that abstract the hardware and allows us, allows us, allows us to, get, to use the peripherals um, pretty conveniently. Um, so we have CMSYS, which is uh, developed by ARM. It's an open source library. Um, that gives access to the capabilities of the core, the uh, ARM Cortex-M core. And we have a HAL, a hardware abstraction library, uh, using C functions, uh, which is provided by STM. 
Uh, and of course, we can use uh, a subset of uh, other of the standard library of Boost, uh, and there are a few other libraries that uh, we we can use. So this is what we have to to work with. What happened? Okay. Okay. So um, one. Um, important feature um, of this architecture um, that we need to understand um, is memory mapped devices. So uh, the idea here is that the uh, address space we use um, has addresses not only for memory, um, so it has address spaces for different kinds of memories used here. There are two, two kinds of SRAM that are on the chip. There's support for uh, additional RAM that is uh, outside the chip if you need more RAM. And there's flash memory on chip, and uh, you can use additional flash memory. Um, so this is all types of memory that are just um, mapped to different addresses and can be used by the, our program um, transparently. And there's also something called bit banding. Um, in, in embedded, you sometimes need to um, set or clear specific bits. And this is a very um, common operation. And um, like in, in the normal style of programming, to set one bit, you need to read the byte into a register, change it, and then set the bit um, back uh, into the address. So if you want to change, the, you basically need to write or read at least a byte for every bit you change. So to optimize this, um, the architecture gives you special address spaces uh, where each bit is mapped into a byte. Um, so for uh, important regions of the memory, you, can, you have this special um, stretched region, um, which is very um, fast for certain kind of, kinds of operations. Um, so these are all um, different kinds of memory uh, access. You also have registers mapped to the address space. And you have peripherals. So um, the serial port uh, is mapped to uh, special addresses. Um, I.O. ports, like if I want to um, turn on a LED or turn off a LED, uh, I just write uh, one or zero to um, a special address in the memory. So, yes, I, I forgot to say, please um, interrupt me for questions uh, whenever. I believe uh, this is, um, so uh, when I say registers, these are not the CPU registers that are used for operations. Um, but configuration registers used to control all of the devices. So this is the low-level um, way to expose all the different peripherals uh, in a unified way. Uh, so the, the diagram you see just um, shows the architecture where you have a bus and you have a lot of different um, things that sit on this bus. Some of them are the memory, and some of them are other stuff. And everything on this bus is exposed um, through the same address space. So um, from a programming standpoint, it, this is all just memory. And, and the reason I'm mentioning this is some of the addresses we see in the memory um, are not just um, simple RAM that only we have access to. Other devices on the bus are working on them uh, concurrently with us. So um, this is kind of like 
something we, we used to uh, on a server setting, it's like another thread is writing to the same uh, address space. Uh, so different kinds of, different types of the address space have um, special um, semantics that you have to, to respect. So um, we need a way to represent this uh, in, uh, in, in a way that the C++ compiler will, will understand. Uh, okay, this is, uh, I, I already explained this. So the, the, the mechanism we have um, to describe this kind of memory is with the word volatile. Um, volatile has been um, partially deprecated, but this use of the word deprecated uh, uh, remains and will remain in the future. Um, what volatile means uh, in, in C++ and there's a, a very amusing uh, talk by J.F. Bastian uh, about this, um, is simply uh, telling the compiler that um, the um, variable we're talking about uh, has to be um, actually accessed with memory instructions, with uh, load and store, uh, every time it's used in the program. Uh, meaning the compiler can't optimize it away and it can't uh, store it in a register. So um, the way I understand uh, the standard, this is the only thing the word volatile uh, means. Um, basically that any read and write uh, to this um, variable uh, has to be treated as a side effect uh, by the compiler. So um, one thing this doesn't mean is that accesses to volatile are atomic. Basically, it doesn't, um, from the standards point of view, it doesn't say anything about concurrency. Uh, so uh, the use you see here, when I, I have a volatile int um, and I use uh, the increment operator on it, that's deprecated. Um, just to avoid the impression that this is one operation, because uh, this is not an atomic operation, and um, something else can access the, the variable and lead to uh, a race condition. And the word volatile doesn't, uh, change, doesn't change it. Um, so volatile... Um, doesn't um, in in the C plus plus standard it doesn't say anything more, but the standard uh, leaves it to implementations to give additional meaning to the word, uh, and the the way volatile is interpreted um, varies from platform to platform and from compiler to compiler. I think it's safe to say that um, the order of accesses to different volatiles um, uh, has to be respected. It, ca the, it can't be reordered. Uh, but the ordering between volatile and other non-volatile variables uh, can be arbitrary. So um, here we have a, a, a code example. Um, this is how um, it's very common to implement a mutex in this kind of setting. So um, you have a volatile bool that says uh, if the, the mutex is used or not. Uh, and in the code, we start some kind of asynchronous operation, and then we just do a while, um, just a spin lock. We do a busy wait, uh, waiting until uh, the mutex um, will be set. Uh, so we wait forever. Uh, notice there's a semicolon after the while. Uh, and after a mutex is set, 
um, we um, reset it again, and then we know that the other operation, uh, the, basically the event was signaled. Uh, and the, the, the signaling is done um, from callbacks, usually from interrupts. Uh, interrupts are basically just um, special callback functions that uh, are used in the system to represent uh, high priority events. And they can interrupt our code and they can also interrupt one another. So um, whenever uh, an, uh, an external uh, device uh, triggers the, the event, the system will call one of the callbacks, which will uh, access the, the um, quote-unquote mutex uh, boolean. And this is the way um, a mutex is implemented or an event is implemented um, commonly. Now, I I'm not exactly sure. Yes? Sorry? You mean atomics or fences or barriers? So um, the platform um, has support for um, special operations that uh, are basically ma mapped to uh, C++11 atomics. So you can use them. That's the way uh, I, I said it. Um, some people use an operating system on this platform. So that's the way. In, when you have threads, of course, th this will not work. Uh, so that's the way uh, you implement an operating system. Um, it's not incorrect, um, but it may be slightly less efficient. I assuming this, this is correct. Uh, and I believe the... To know if this is correct or not, you have to check the compiler and the, the platform. Uh, I, I believe on, on, on my platform this, this is correct. You can see this in, in the code supplied by the, the vendor. Um, but any platform is, is different here. So, but, but, but yes, there is support for memory barriers. Uh, at the, at the uh, core level, and there is support for atomic operations. Uh, you, you can use them. And of course, this kind of uh, synchronization objects can be um, extended to any kind of uh, more complicated uh, signaling mechanism uh, you'd like to use. I, be, I didn't try, but I believe, I believe so. L like th th there is an equivalent um, function call provided by the uh, Cortex M library, which wraps the assembly instructions. So I, I, the only question is, is if the standard library um, uses it, and I, I, I assume it is. So you, you can use it. Of course, if this wasn't a volatile, uh, you'd need to use memory barriers, and um, this um, again, this is this relies on on um, the fact that the compiler um, adds memory barriers um, in w when it sees accesses to volatile uh, m uh, memory. Okay. So I think um, that's all I had to say about um, this form of synchronization. Um, so the next um, problem I tried to, to tackle um, is 
protocol checking. Um, by protocol, I mean uh, a series of API calls uh, to um, syllabaries or to registers uh, that you need um, to, to perform something. Um, the protocols on these devices are quite complicated, uh, and the C um, hardware abstraction library um, doesn't do any, any checking. Like if you try to um, read from a peripheral, from per peripheral that you um, didn't initialize or you turned off, um, it, it will just fail. Uh, and in, so the, the initialis in, in initialization code in general is very, very complicated, so complicated that uh, the vendor doesn't expect you to write it yourself. They're providing a non open source tool that will generate the initialization code. So there's a GUI and you define uh, what, what you want to do and they generate um, like an empty project that you can use. So um, it, the, 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 the question I'm raising here is, can we afford um, to uh, use some kind of state um, to, to check the protocols? Um, as, as an example, write the protocol as a um, class that will have um, additional members uh, meant to, to test, to, to store the state in a way that we can um, generate um, better error messages. Um, the, the, the alternative to this is to use uh, either, either, either use static checking um, which is very limited because the protocol is something that happens uh, in runtime. So it's very, it's very difficult to analyze the code and know if the protocol is being respected or not. Uh, or use tracing. Um, there's like hardware level tracing. You can do packet sniffing and you can, if you have a communication uh, especially, you can try to analyze the protocol from the outside and, and then uh, test the validity. Um, but for, for uh, things occurring on the chip, and it's the, the, the all, all debug tools have some kind of cost. Um, they can't um, run, um, they can't have zero, zero cost, because we need to update the, uh, our own version of the state to be able to check it. So, um, I, my, my guess is that um, we, we can um, write this kind of uh, checking for non-timing um, critical code, um, especially for initialization, this can be really helpful. Um, because I think that's also the biggest um, cause uh, for um, most errors, is that you're trying to do something you didn't uh, initialize uh, correctly. The initialization can be very um, complicated, and there's, um, the documentation has a like, list of steps you have to do to initialize um, properly. Um, so I think this is a place where a better, harder abstraction library written using classes um, can help. Um, but I don't know of anyone that's written something like, like this. And in principle, this kind of library of an abstraction can also have negative costs. Because we can use generic programming and, and do optimizations based on the types. Which is sometimes, uh, which is something that the C um, level uh, APIs can't do. Okay, so um, back to the project. 
this is um, uh, uh, this is just an overview of um, the different uh, components uh, in in my um, radar um, sensor. So uh, the left block. Can you hear me? Okay. So the left block um, is all uh, contained on the chip. Uh, we have. Still hear me? So um, we have um, two analog digital uh, converters that we use to sample um, the um, um, the signal received by the radar. We have a digital analog converter that is used to synthesize uh, the signal used to control the radar. The radar has antennas, and it's basically um, sending uh, the signal and receiving uh, the return um, that's returned by some kind of object. Uh, and we uh, sample uh, the result uh, and um, process it in memory and potentially write it um, to a serial port and do anything you want uh, on, on the memory. So that's the basic um, design of the system. Um, this, the, I, I chose this specific chip because it has all these peripherals on it. So everything you need is on this chip. Um, basically, you only need this chip and the sensor, uh, and that's the radar. Um, but in practice, you do need a few more things um, to interface the two of them together. So um, I couldn't find uh, uh, an interface that's available, so I um, designed a very simple board um, that basically supplies the power, the different um, voltages needed by the sensor and does all the communication between them, uh, including amplifying the signals, uh, and does a few other um, uh, things to simplify debugging. Um, so I had um, the PCB um, uh, made, and I soldered the components. And here you can see uh, initial testing uh, of the device. The yellow thing in the bottom is the serial interface used, so it's, it goes uh, to the USB port. Uh, and basically, you, there's another USB cable that used to program it, and that, that's everything you need. You just connect it to USB, uh, and you can start uh, writing your code. Okay, so uh, uh, the the code basic, the, the, like the, the essential thing we need to do is to sample the data from the receiver and to generate uh, the signal that's used to control the transmitter. So th these are the tasks um, we have to do. Um, and each of these peripherals is independent. They can run uh, in parallel. So in principle, um, like the, the simple way to do it is just um, to read the data from ADC, uh, to process it, and then UART is the serial port to, to store the, to send the results or do something with them. Then you read another, um, another few samples, process them, and then process them, and then, excuse me, send them. Uh, so that's like the simple um, serial implementation. In practice, each of these um, um, processes can run uh, in parallel. Um, so um, the, the like, traditional C style approach to this is just to take um, the code that's controlling all of them and just interleave it together into a big function and basically, you need to um, create some kind of state machine that knows um, what's the next thing that, need, that needs to happen. Uh, and then like you have uh, the control code and the 
state code all like, and the control code for all the different um, uh, elements all mixed together. And that, that's uh, if you um, look at code, that's how it's usually done, done today. Um, I wanted to use coroutines uh, as an alternative here. And I think coroutines are a very um, elegant um, solution to this uh, problem. Um, because basically they allow us to interleave um, different processes together. So we can write each of the processes separately and then just switch control between the different elements. And the switching can be done very inexpensively. You don't need threads, you don't need anything. Um, and you don't need to, um, to write the state machine um, explicitly. Uh, it can just be inferred based on, on the relationships. Uh, so on the right, you see um, just example of what I mean. So you see a simple coroutine um, that has uh, that only uh, handles the ADC, the, the sampling part uh, of the process. So um, basically, um, we start the ADC um, sampling, and then we wait um, for a signal um, that this, the um, sampling is completed, and then we do something to reset the um, peripheral and prefer it for the next sampling. And then we wait for an, another kind of signal um, telling us that the processing of this um, data has been done and we can um, um, resume another um, sample, taking another sample. Uh, and in this way, uh, like to, to parallelize, we can use two buffers. So we write into one buffer while the other buffer is being read, just double buffering. Uh, and here I show just uh, as a sketch how uh, you implement this double buffering here. So you only have um, this aspect of the code written as a very... Um, simple um, coroutine, uh, and you can have different functions to do other parts of the, of the um, work. So I think the, the, this approach is, is very um, elegant and, and simple. Um, the code you see here almost works. Um, in practice, uh, I couldn't actually get it to work. So coroutines um, work uh, on, on the microcontrollers. So uh, you can do interleaving and um, the, the, the basic uh, approach works. Uh, the, program, the problem is that there is no um, mature support library um, for doing uh, coroutines uh, on a microcontroller. Um, as, as you probably know, um, there's no standard library uh, included in C20, uh, and there's also no um, open source library I could find. Uh, the best, the closest thing I could find um, is something written uh, for an academic paper by Bruce Belson, and they have a library that does a lot of the um, difficult things. Uh, doing coroutines um, requires storage for the stack frames, and usually the storage is on the heap. And on a microcontroller, we don't have a heap. So they had to use a lot of different um, tricks to um, allocate all the uh, needed memory uh, statically uh, in an efficient way. Um, this is made even um, more complicated by the fact that the size of the memory you need for storing uh, all the stack frames is not known at compile time. 
um, only at link time. Um, so, uh, but basically in, in um, reasonable situations, you can just uh, allocate enough uh, memory uh, in advance and um, know that uh, uh, you, you won't run out of memory later. Um, so um, this library does most of the work, um, but I couldn't get it to work uh, with actually IO code, um, um, probably for um, just um, silly um, reasons, um, like incompatibility, it was developed for another chip or something uh, like, like that, I don't know exactly uh, why. Uh, do you know how much time I have? Thanks. Okay. Um, so this is the sad uh, ending for the coroutines uh, story. Uh, I still believe this is a very promising uh, direction. Um, but I, I, at the moment, I, I, I couldn't fix the library uh, on, my, on my own. Um, so, um, using this code um, without the coroutines, um, I implemented um, what, what we uh, see here, and the um, analysis I want to show you uh, is um, very basic and standard in this setting, um, which is a Doppler radar. So um, the idea here is that um, 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 an object moving uh, towards or away from the antenna causes a shift in the frequency uh, of the signal, and this um, shift in frequency uh, can be uh, measured. Um, the, the measurement is done uh, by sampling and then doing FFT uh, on the, resu uh, the resulting samples. So this is very basic uh, DSP, and of course there is a very efficient implementation of FFT and that's running on the device and taking almost no time. Uh, so in that way, uh, we basically have a sensor that can measure um, um, the, the speeds of objects relative to it. So um, to test it, I came up with the following very um, scientific um, and advanced radar target, which is basically a PC fan with a speed controller. And you can see um, the sensor uh, in front of it. Uh, and this way, this is the kind of signal you get. Um, what you see here, um, so the, the y-axis represents time. So this is a few seconds of recorded signals. And the, the graph shows you the FFT results, which is basically the... the speeds that we measure, the frequencies we measure um, relative to the sensor. Um, so um, what you see here uh, is basically, um, I hope you can see, you see it okay, but you see uh, that there's a few speeds uh, and uh, around uh, 200 units they change, the speed increases, increases and around 300, uh, the speed goes back. And this is basically just me uh, turning the knob and changing the speed of the fan. So you see measurement uh, of speed. And on the right, you see this is just um, one um, a sample, just one um, cross-section across this graph. Uh, and you can see uh, that the strongest uh, frequency we measured 
uh, is around 220 hertz. Uh, and for comparison, the um, maximum speed of the fan, according to the box, is 2,000 RPM, which is 233 hertz. Uh, so this makes sense. Um, so oh, okay. Then this is something weird is happening. So this is the the other graph shows you another spectrum. Um, this time, what I did is just um, very slowly move the fan towards and away from the sensor. Um, so you see, um, just uh, the strength of the signal increase and decrease. Um, we already saw that. And what you see here um, is just me moving the fan uh, quickly towards and away from the um, sensor. Um, this kind of measurement uh, is done uh, in the industry um, to, like for a lot of different things, but it, it's used for um, gesture recognition and for um, like uh, recognizing activities. Like you can use the Doppler signature to see if someone is walking towards you or running, or like identify different activities based on this kind of signature. And this is the last uh, spectrum. And the red bands here uh, are cars approaching. Um, OK, so wh what I showed is uh, just um, basic uh, Doppler radar. Um, this kind of... Um, um, like the, the, I said before that the sensor has a lot of flexibility. And what I mean is that we can uh, just change the software and get other kinds of, uh, um, other types of radars uh, implemented. For example, um, we have two um, um, samples provided by the radar antenna. Uh, and the difference, basically the phase between them, indicates angle relative to the sensor. So this is something I'm, I'm not showing, but uh, you can do, use it uh, to measure the, the angle um, uh, relative uh, to the sensor. This is one kind of thing. Uh, you only need to change the processing and you already have everything you need. Another approach that is commonly uh, used um, is called FM CW radar, uh, which means um, changing the tuning using the DAC to change the signal that is fed to the radar um, to change the frequency of the signal, of the uh, outgoing signal. Uh, and this can be used uh, to measure not only speed relative to the sensor, but also range. Uh, this gives an uh, independent uh, measurement of range. Uh, I can't go into why right now, um, but uh, this is just um, a few of the basic approaches that's uh, possible. And again, you only need to change the software uh, to, to get. Um, so um, the, the final thing I wanted uh, to say, and I'll spend a minute on it, um, is how you can um, use uh, supervised learning, uh, how you can do um, machine learning algorithms in this setting. And the basic um, principle you do is um, you can't do the training and the development of the model on uh, the microcontroller. Um, so you basically have to split the um, the operations into separate dif separate uh, kinds. Um, 
first, uh, you measure different kind of uh, uh, stimulus with the sensor, and you record it and take it back to your server, to the PC, and then you use it to develop a model and train the model and um, do all the rest of the things you need um, to find an optimal model. And then you take the model back to the device uh, and run only done only do the, the prediction step uh, on the device. Um, so usually you have to um, optimize the model and uh, create a really small uh, model, relatively uh, speaking. Um, like you can't have millions of parameters on this kind of device. So there are tools to um, minimize the model to find an equivalent tiny model. Uh, and then only the prediction step is run on the device, and the prediction is sent back, and then you can uh, calculate accuracy and do all, all the rest of the things. So this is um, basically how, uh, how you do um, this work usually. And there are um, libraries like TensorFlow that have a lot of uh, support for doing this. Um, Google... Um, say they, they are um, running uh, on millions of devices using this kind of uh, approach, using TensorFlow. Uh, so I think that's it. Um, thank you for your atten attention, and I, if time, I can answer more questions. Uh, and also, if someone wants to see the prototype, is here. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much.